Good morning or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Uh, I'm John Wiener. I'm a pediatric urologist at Duke University. I'm excited to uh, be giving this lecture on something I have a lot of passion about, and that's uh, taking care of individuals with spina bifida. Um, this is going to be a little different session today because um, uh, I'm going to talk about the more the pediatric part, and we have coordinated with Dr. Rose Kavari. Uh, at Methodist Hospital in Houston, and she's going to do the second hour on transition and adult care of the spina bifida patient. So uh, these are somewhat coordinated. We'll have some questions uh, um, that we can do a poll on uh, in between. Um, so I'll uh, let Dr. Kavari introduce herself. And she may be on mute. Oh, there she is. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'm Rose Kavari. I'm an adult urologist at uh, Houston Methodist in Houston. Um, this is also my passion, taking care of patients who have had congenital genitourinary anomalies and now they have trans transitioned to the adult world. Um, uh, I also do obviously neurogenic bladder, female urology, and a lot of uh, prosthesis and um, uh, some reconstructive male urology as well. I'll be doing the adult um, urological care of spina bifida patients. And I, I'm a little bit of an unusual pediatric urologist in that my hospital is not a freestanding children's hospital like the one down the block from Dr. Kavari where I did my fellowship. So I take care of patients of all ages as well. Um, but uh, again, I'll address, start with the pediatric part. Okay, so um, uh, just some uh, disclosures. Uh, I am a funded researcher from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as part of the National Spine Bifida Patient Registry and the Umpire Protocol, which we'll discuss. Um, I'm also on the board of directors of the Spine Bifida Association, but that is a volunteer position. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can't give a talk without showing where you work, and I'm pretty proud of where I work. Uh, I uh, went to college um, here, so my dorm was not far from here, and you can see our new hospital tower over here. Um, so why talk about spina bifida? Uh, well, first of all, you've got a test to take, uh, and I know there'll be spina bifida questions on it. As I served on the exam committee, uh, there are always going to be questions on neurogenic bladder. But in general, uh, spina bifida is the most common non-chromosomal disorder affecting multiple organ systems that is compatible with life. And this photo here um, is uh, yeah, an open neural tube defect uh, on the lower spine. Um, it's also the most common permanently disabling birth defect. The CDC estimates that there are 166,000 Americans living with spina bifida. And to put that in perspective, that's four times as many Americans that live with cystic fibrosis, which gets a lot more press and a lot more money, and twice as many as with sickle cell disease. A little background, we think there are about 1,600 births annually in the US. Uh, in the 1990s, folate was added to the American um, uh, diet, basically by enriching flour, and that has decreased the incidence probably by about a third. Uh, it's been added to corn masa, uh, because a lot of uh, Hispanics weren't getting, weren't using uh, enriched flour, and it is more common in Hispanics. Uh, the majority of Americans uh, with spina bifida today are adults. At our clinic, uh, about 38% of our patients are over 18. Um, and myelomeningocele, the most severe, the open neural tube defect, is the uh, most common form. And of those, about 90 to 95% will have neuropathic bladder. So that's why we urologists are so involved with these patients. Um, in general, in spina bifida, it really is one of the great success stories of medicine in the 20th century. Prior to 1960, that was before I was born, um, surgery was often postponed until they were two years old because they had the philosophy that only the strong would survive. If they didn't die of meningitis or hydrocephalus, many died of urologic complications. But again, this is an amazing triumph. 
uh, again, we went from survival of about 10% through infancy in the 1950s. Uh, and we'll look at this series uh, from Britain in the 1960s of 117 individuals. And in the first year, uh, only 79% uh, survived and into adulthood about 52%. Um, when you, and that's because the main reason was because from this SBA um, ad, uh, thanks to medical interventions like the shunt, more people with spina bifida lived to adulthood than ever before. So it's really the neurosurgical things that really made a big difference. But you can see here that renal failure in this series was still a significant cause of mortality. And in fact, was the most common form of mortality after age one. Um, today, the five-year survival rate is uh, above 90% in Europe and North America. Um, and survival into adulthood is really expected. Um, just some data from one of our papers in the net using the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry. Uh, this was from 2018, and 20% of the patients uh, in the registry were adults of 1,300. 19% uh, of those who were 25 and older had college degrees, and 35% of those 25 and older were employed full-time or part-time. That's about half the U.S. rate of uh, college education. Today with COVID, uh, the employment thing may be a little uh, off kilter, but um, these are people that, that can go to college and graduate. These are people that can hold jobs. Not all of them, but a significant number. A bit on mortality. Um, this study from France, there were 138 uh, deaths recorded from 2019 to 14, 2009 to 14 at public and private hospitals, and the leading cause of in-hospital deaths was urologic at 17% of the total. And they were due to UTIs, renal failure, bladder cancer, and other causes. Uh, a study that was recently accepted for the uh, ESPU and SPU meeting that was going to happen in uh, Lisbon in October, um, uh, led by Conrad Szymanski at Indiana. Uh, there were 316 deaths. Uh, this is uh, all locations. It didn't have to be in the hospital. At 16 institutions over 47 years. And neurologic deaths were not the most common cause, but still amounted to about 10%. So in terms of management, the overall themes are that the urologic management is critical for survival, a healthy life, a good quality of life. And so our goals are that they grow up with healthy kidneys and maintain them once they're finished growing, that we minimize UTI, become dry if desired. A lot of patients will require catheterization or medications or surgery, and we'll talk about that. Not everybody wants that, so we can't make everybody dry, but if they desire, then that's a goal. Um, and also to become continent of stool if desired, because uh, we'll talk about how that's important for quality of life. And uh, Dr. Cavario will go into it a little bit more, but uh, satisfactory sex life, uh, if that's something they are interested in. Uh, this is a uh, cartoon from Campbell's, but it highlights uh, that the nerves to the bladder and the sexual organs, particularly in the male, come off the lumbar sacral spine. And so the hypogastric and pelvic nerves and the pudendal nerves are really the nerves we're concerned with, and they're affected in most of these patients. So to start with, uh, if those nerves are affected, uh, is a urinary tract safe at birth? And this study from Sweden where they did serial urodynamics uh, is probably the best look at that. And it showed that there were safe bladders in most of the patients. There were 34 consecutive infants with myeloma meningocele in the late 80s, and 32% had nor normal urodynamics. 24 had areflexic or, or uh, uh, under contraction. And the old term hyperreflexia or detrusor of activity was moderate in 29% and severe in 14%. So that's bladder function. What about the upper tracts? Are they normal initially? Well, this study that uh, came out last year from the umpire trial, uh, which we'll talk about, 
the initial radiologic findings were normal in most. Uh, this study is at nine sites in the U.S. Uh, are 193 newborns between 2015 and 18, and hydro hydronephrosis detected by ultrasound uh, was not seen in 56 percent, was mild uh, with SFU grades one and two in 40 percent, and only moderate or severe in four percent. Reflux was only seen in 15 percent of patients, and it was dilating reflux like grades four and five in eight percent. Uh, DMSA scans were done uh, in the sites that could get DMSA, and uh, it was only abnormal in 6% of children and 8% of kidneys. So most of the patients are starting out with fairly normal leopard tracts. The big question is, do these urinary tracts stay safe? And upper tract deterioration is common over time. By age 5, up to 50% will suffer some degree of kidney damage. The neuropathic bladder may not empty well. It may not store urine well or at safe pressures, and that can lead to kidney damage or kidney failure, recurrent UTIs, urinary incontinence. So how do we know this? Well, looking back uh, at a follow-up study from Sweden, um, uh, they did urodynamics at 1, 4, and 10 months, and the areflexic bladders, four of eight of those, half of them developed moderate detrusor overactivity. Of the normal ones, three of the 11 developed moderate or severe detrusor overactivity. Of the moderate detrusor overactivity, three of the 10 became severe. And poor compliance was found in seven at one month, nine at four months, and at 10 months. And four of those had no detrusor activity to start with. Uh, the study by Ken Kropp uh, from Toledo showed that 45% of the low risk bladders became high risk at a mean of three years. So what was the old school solution to this? They knew the bladders got bad and could lead to renal failure. So in the 1960s and 70s, external urinary diversion was expected. This study uh, in the Journal of Urology from Melbourne, Australia in 1972, only 3% of the children had normal control and um, a third of them went to bed. 3% had died of UTIs, kidney failure, or urologic surgical complications. 70% had a permanent incontinent urinary diversion, basically a ileal conduit. 90% uh, of the girls had them and 51% of the boys. Um, and I have adult patients who've lived their lives with the external appliance, but uh, we think this is probably not the best way to have a good quality of life for most children. Uh, as a little aside here, I don't know if, uh, how much you've been watching uh, Netflix uh, during the COVID crisis. Uh, there's a great um, documentary uh, called Crip Camp. Um, the producers were uh, Barack and Michelle Obama. It won the uh, best um, documentary at Sundance. Um, it's about a camp for uh, disabled kids in upstate New York near Woodstock. Um, and one of the people they follow is James Lebrecht. Uh, he's actually one of the producers and uh, you can see him as an adult there with the tie-dye shirt on and the picture of when he was 16. Um, and he talked about how uh, before going to camp, he'd gotten an ileal conduit and he was no longer uh, in diapers and how much more mature he felt by being dry. So uh, if you've got, got the time, it's a, it's a good watch on Netflix. Um, so the evolution of the management of neurogenic bladder uh, was due to the advances in the 1970s. Um, uh, Lapides, uh, as you probably have heard many times, uh, uh, proved that you could do clean intermittent catheterization um, and that that was a safe thing to do. Uh, actually, also in the Journal of Urology, the same year was another article by Lapides talking about anti-muscarinic medication called oxybutynin. So we had a medical therapy to decrease bladder contraction. And then also urodynamic evaluation was coming along. Uh, so we had a way to to measure and, and stratify bladders in high risk or low risk. And then this allowed continent bladder reconstruction uh, to occur rather than doing incontinent diversion. So we'll talk a little bit about urodynamic evaluation. Um, for orientation in pink here is the vesicle pressure, the abdominal pressures in 
navy here, and the PDET here is in green. And you can see here's a patient with poor compliance as the pressure rises during bladder filling like that. Uh, that's what we don't really want to see. Um, so I'll use that as a segue to look back at the famous McGuire paper uh, from 1981, because everybody quotes numbers from this. And I think uh, for urologists in training, it's important to, to look at this paper because we all quote it. Um, so just some quotes. Uh, McGuire said, the role of urodynamic evaluation in these patients with myelomeningocele remains to be defined. They generally have not been used as a guide to therapy. Um, and so the purpose of the study was to determine whether urodynamic testing benefited the patient or the urologist. And along with this, the patients had serial radiographic studies, which were IVPs, because ultrasound didn't exist back then, or, or wasn't a tool for urologists, and VCUG. So you have to realize this is not necessarily sonographic data of hydronephrosis. It is all from IVP. So it was 42 patients aged 3 to 15. 86% had an open bladder outlet, which was unrelated to the level of bony involvement of the spine. The mean pressure was, six, was 36 centimeters of water. 14% had a closed bladder outlet, and their mean pressure was 51. So if your bladder outlet was closed, you more like you had a higher pressure. Um, in terms of having a, a response to filling uh, where there was an increase in pressure, uh, that was seen in 17%, and that was normal in 10, where they could actually have a contraction. Uh, and detrusor sphincter dyssynergia was seen in 7%. A reflexic response to filling was seen in 83%, and there was progressive increase in pressure with increasing volume, what we call poor compliance, in the vast majority of those in an atonic bladder in 12. Here's kind of the money slide. Um, so those with a pressure less than 40, that was 20 of the patients, and those with a pressure greater than 40 was 22 or a little over half. But those with a low pressure, um, none had reflux and only 10% had ureteral dilation. Of those with pressures greater than 40, uh, two thirds had reflux and 80% had upper tract dilation. So we concluded that the major clinical problems were incontinence in patients with low urethral closing pressures and the degree of urinary retention, upper urinary tract deterioration, and the development of reflux in those with higher urethral closing pressures. So talking about these higher pressures can be a detrusor leak point pressure or an infilling pressure. If you can't leak, you can't have a leak point pressure. So it's not right to talk about leak point pressures in patients that don't leak. We call, because um, a leak point pressure is a detrusor pressure with static leakage in the absence of a contraction. So the leak point pressure, the detrusor leak point pressure is not during a contraction, that's a contraction pressure. Um, but we know that elevated pressures, whether they leak at a pressure or they don't leak and have a high infilling pressure, will lead to high urinary storage pressures, which can cause reflux. But you don't have to have reflux to have problems. If your ureteral emptying, if the pressure in the bladder is greater than the ureteral emptying pressure, the ureters can't push the urine into the bladder and the pressure backs up and causes upper tract damage without reflux. Some people believe that the pressure may exceed the diastolic blood pressure in the bladder and therefore you get some bladder ischemia and that may be causing scarring and trabeculation. But this is not the kind of bladder we wanna see with a severe trabeculation and reflux. Uh, this is the same patient with a DMSA scan and you can see the upper tract damage here from recurrent infections. But again, the urodynamic pictures are dynamic. Um, patients or they're going to, they can change over time. So we must be vigilant because the bladder function will change in some patients. And, that, and as that does, the uh, vis, viscoelastic properties of the bladder will change. Um, could be one cause of it. Another could be that there could be neurologic changes. So again, if you believe in the ischemia theory, the bladder wall just changes regardless 
of whether there have been neurologic changes. On the other hand, there can be neurologic changes such as tethered cord and the nerves function differently. Um, remember that the distal spinal cord and the nerves are gonna be encased in scar from when their back was closed. And with growth, the spinal cord can get tethered in that scar and that can give you worsening bladder and function and upper tract changes. Other signs and, that we ask about are, is there lower extremity pain, numbness, and tingling? And beware the pubertal growth spurt. That's really, uh, after infancy, that's when there's the fastest change in, in growth. And so we see kids who have safe bladders, who their bladders become hostile as they grow during puberty because the nerves get trapped. So in terms of urine, urodynamic evaluation, pediatric urologists are in two camps. Uh, the reactive camp, and those uh, believe that you just follow them clinically with imaging only, and that urodynamics can be done only if there's worsening, and then you intervene at that time. Uh, studies have shown that there seems to be no greater risk of renal decline if you watch these patients carefully. The other camp is proactive, where you evaluate with urodynamics initially to stratify the patients that are you're concerned about and the ones you need to be more active, uh, and then follow up regularly with urodynamics. Uh, and you intervene early for worrisome urodynamics. And the hope is, is that not only will you protect the upper tracts, but maybe the bladder will, will behave better and you won't need to do a bladder augmentation later. So what guidelines do we have? There are two sets of guidelines. They're both from 2018. The European Society of Pediatric Urology published in European Urology and the Spina Bifida Association guidelines and the fourth edition of the guidelines came out also in 2018. Dr. Kavari was on the uh, urology guidelines panel. I, I was on the men's health guidelines panel. Um, so in general, the EAU approach is proactive and the SBA says that they merge the aspects of proactive and reactive philosophies. Renal ultrasound um, in Europe, uh, get it at birth and then repeat annually, a little more aggressive here in the US, uh, at birth six, 12 and 18 months and then annually and then repeat if they're symptomatic UTIs or worsening urodynamics. In terms of labs, uh, in Europe, uh, get a plasma creatinine in the first week of life, and then, and not specific, but say get lifelong follow-up of renal function. Later in life, cystatin C may be more accurate. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, the SBA says uh, get a serum creatinine within the first three months, and then if their upper tract changes, and then begin getting yearly at age five. So in terms of monitoring, renal function, there really is no agreement on how to best measure it. Uh, serum creatinine is problematic. Spina bifida patients typically have reduced muscle mass because their lower extremities aren't normally innervated. Therefore, they don't make as much creatinine as uh, somebody who is, has the same size torso. So we may be uh, um, overestimating bladder capacity, excuse me, overestimating renal function, uh, by using serum creatinine. Cystatin C has shown some promise, but it's really unclear which of the multiple uh, EGFR formulas are best to use. And uh, there are people uh, doing a lot of research in this area. The gold standard for measuring GFR is a serum nuclear medicine uh, DTPA injection with time blood draws to look at the, the clearance because uh, DTPA is is only excreted through uh, glomerular filtration. In terms of a nuclear scan, neither study recommend the DTPS, DTPA scan. We are including that in the umpire study. Uh, the EAU recommended a DMSA scan as a baseline. Um, that's also in the umpire study, but not a regular guideline. Um, in terms of urodynamics, uh, both recommend getting it in two to three months. Um, EAU says to get it annually, depending on the clinical situation, and fluoroscopy is helpful uh, to look for reflux, to look at trabeculation, um, or if you don't have 
video urodynamics do a VCUG. Um, SBA says get it annually till age three, and then only if there are upper tract changes, recurrent UTIs, or the patient desires to gain continence. In terms of clean intermittent catheterization, EAU being more aggressive recommends early initiation um, uh, as a newborn, get the parents used to it, um, but you can delay if there's an underactive sphincter, meaning a weak outlet, and there's no DSD, detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. SBA guidelines are for, uh, uh, do it for mixed incontinence uh, based on the ultrasound and urodynamics, and that we should begin involving the child in self-cath beginning at age three to five. In terms of anticholinergic medications, in Europe, uh, they recommend starting early if there's detrusor overactivity. Um, there's not great proof that that uh, gives better long-term outcomes, but that's uh, a theory. Uh, if that is refractory, then you inject Botox, and if there's poor response, do a bladder augmentation. Uh, the SBA guidelines just say initiate anticholinergic medication for mixed incontinence when indicated. The European guidelines go a little bit more into surgical uh, management and say offer a bladder outlet procedure at the sphincters week and combine with bladder augmentation in most patients. They also recommend continent catheterizable channel in patients with difficulty cathing per urethra. Bowel management um, is recommended to achieve continence and independence. Um, and there's separate bowel management guidelines in the SBA uh, set. Uh, with sexuality, uh, uh, begin discussion in adolescence, and again, there's separate guidelines um, in the SBA document. And the SBA document is uh, free to download from their website. It's about uh, 200 pages. Um, in terms of urinary tract infections, uh, the EAU says treat only if symptomatic. The SBA says uh, give some specific definitions, which I'll cover, and treat only if you meet the definitions and obtaining the specimen by catheterization is encouraged. So the SBA definition is they must have all of the following, a positive urinalysis and a positive urine culture, leakage between CIC and the onset of pelvic or back pain and a fever greater than 100.438. Positive urinalysis is defined by more than trace nitrites and leukocyte esterase on dipstick and greater than 10 white blood cells per high-powered field for centrifuged and five per uncentrifuged specimen. Positive urine culture is greater than 50,000 CFUs per ml by sterile catheterization or superfubic aspiration. That superfubic aspiration is almost never done, but uh, it, is a, it is on the guidelines. Um, if it's a clean voided specimen, then greater than 100,000 colonies. Um, other guidelines, vitamin B12 and serum chemistries. Uh, EAU recommends getting it lifelong if the terminal ileum is used in reconstruction. Obviously, we want to avoid the terminal ileum, but you're never quite sure where you are, so they recommend doing that. Um, SBA recommends doing it yearly, beginning two years after reconstructive surgery. Cystoscopy, screening for malignancy, Dr. Kavari is going to cover that in more detail, but the guidelines in Europe say consider annually beginning 10 or 15 years after reconstructive surgery. SBA says in adults after surgery, only if their upper tract changes, gross hematuria, symptomatic UTI, increasing incontinence, pelvic pain, history of renal transplant, or with uh, BK or polyoma virus. Um, EAU doesn't talk about transition to self-care much, but the uh, SBA recommends begin around 17, 13 to 17 years of age, and there's separate guidelines all about transition. So these are treatment options we've talked about. I'm gonna go over them in a lot more detail. Uh, so I just made some algorithms here. So if you have normal capacity, normal compliance, normal ability to empty, and your outlet isn't weak, then no therapies needed. We'll talk about how rare that is. Uh, if everything's normal, but your ability to empty uh, is poor, then, then intermittent catheterization is all you need. You don't need medication. 
if there's decreased compliance or truce or overactivity, but you're able to empty well, then anticholinergic medication may be able to calm that down. And if you're still able to empty well, then that's all that's needed. Again, those patients are pretty rare. If the ability uh, to empty becomes poor or was poor to start with, then you need to do medication plus catheterization. And if there's poor response to medication to help with the truce or overactivity or decreased compliance, then you need to increase the dose of medication or use a different medication. The next line would be Botox, and the final would be bladder augmentation. And pretty much if you do these things, the patient's definitely gonna need to cat. Um, if you've got normal capacity and compliance, um, but a weak outlet, you can't be dry without bladder outlet surgery. And we'll talk about that. If you've got abnormal compliance, and probably not emptying well, uh, but your, your bladder outlet is improved by doing bladder outlet surgery. So again, let me, so we, we do bladder, neck, bladder outlet surgery, you improve the outlet, but your compliance becomes worse and you probably can't empty well, then you're probably gonna need to do it metropin off as well. Um, and if the appendix isn't good or you use it for the mace and you need to do a Monty procedure, we refer to this as, um, uh, a long day of surgery. Um, so um, if the patient has a poor bladder capacity, it really doesn't matter whether their compliance is good or not, and the outlet is weak, they're gonna need probably a bladder augmentation and cat. If the outlet is not uh, weak, then you don't need to do the bladder outlet procedure. And then, you know, if they've got a small capacity, poor compliance, poor outlet, they're gonna need the bladder augmentation, they're gonna need bladder outlet or bladder neck surgery, and a metrophen off or Monty, or what we call the full Monty. Um, so what's the frequency of all these therapies? Well, we looked at this in the uh, National Spina Bifida Patient Registry, and this was published two years ago. Uh, and the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry uh, currently is about 26 sites. Um, the ones in blue also participate in the umpire trial, which I'll talk about. Um, but uh, looking at the data, there were nearly 2,000 school-age kids, nearly 3,000 adolescents and nearly 1,400 adults. And so looking at how many are on daily antibiotic, it's around 10 to 15 percent, a little bit more of the adults. Anticholinergics, it's about half, becoming a little less toward with increasing age. And those that are on no medical therapy, it's a little less than half. What about surgical history? Well, bladder augmentation, uh, obviously it gets more common as people age, and so it's in 20% of adolescents and 23% of adults. Uh, I just combined the metrophen off and Monty channels, uh, a little more common in adolescents because a lot of the adults grew up before that was an option, so they didn't have it done. But you can see around 10 to 15%. Vesicostomy, done for really uh, uh, worrisome bladders, um, less than 10%. A little surprising how few patients had bladder outlet operations. I think we urologists are not aggressive enough about dealing with the weak outlet. Um, you can see those numbers are quite low. And we also know that nephrolithiasis and bladder stones are more common in uh, patients with spina bifida. In terms of form of management, no management, meaning just being incontinent. Um, and not doing any catheterization or medication and not able to void volitionally, it's a small percentage and it drops to 5% of adults. The numbers that can void spontaneously, it's 20% in the school age children, but drops down to 10%, uh, probably because that, that drops in half because half of them realize that that really doesn't work very well for the majority. Clean intermittent catheterization, this to me was the most important finding of that entire study about three quarters of adolescents and adults are on clean intermittent catheterization. That's really powerful information to tell parents of a child, uh, of a newborn, because 
we can introduce catheterization saying there's a three out of four chance that they're gonna to need to catheterize when they're older. Indwelling catheter, fortunately, is not used much. Vesicostomy uh, is not used much uh, as patients get older. The urostomy bags, the old urinary diversions, um, still about less than 5% of adults per day doesn't work very well and so it's not used much and condom cast is not used very much. Um, so in terms of achieving urinary continence, it protects the skin integrity, it improves the quality of life, and it, looking at that same study, of the 740 adults that were over 25 in the registry, urinary continence was associated with higher educational attainment on univariate analysis and higher employment rates on uni and multivariate analysis. So it's a little chicken or egg, but um, we really push people to uh, dream bigger and um, uh, not only be able to go to college and to work, but also that continence is important toward those goals. Uh, this nice study from Conrad Szymanski in Indiana shows that whether you wear a pull-up or not, or underwear, doesn't, uh, it does decrease the quality of life, but the number you wear doesn't matter. Urinary incontinence, um, having a dry interval of less than four hours decreases your quality of life, but it's really based on volume, so that people with greater degree of incontinence have a lower quality of life than those that leak only a little bit. That's not true for fecal incontinence. It, it is um, volume independent, which would make sense because odor is such a bigger deal. Another paper from the National Spine of Infant Patient Registry, looking at continence, the red circles are myelomeningoceles and the blue circles are those with uh, non-open spina bifida. And you can see, first of all, that patients with myelomeningocele have less continence, but it never exceeds 50% even in adulthood it's a little bit better in those with uh, non-open forms of spina bifida. So in terms of management, uh, the antimuscarinic medications are the mainstay of medical therapy. There's nearly 40 years of experience and the most common side effects are dry mouth, constipation, and dry eyes or blurry vision. It's contraindicated in neurolingual glaucoma and gastroparesis. And there's some controversy about its effect on cognitive effects. Um, the cognitive effects, uh, it's definitely true for elderly, but there's not a lot of evidence that it's true for children. Uh, and of course, it can cause urinary retention. Uh, the dosing is really based on side effects. You can keep increasing the dose until you reach side effects, uh, so you don't just have to stop at, at um, five milligrams or something like that. Um, so, um, looking at this table, oxybutynin is the only one approved for use in children, except in yesterday, uh, um, sol uh, solofenacin was approved for use in a liquid form, but uh, when I made the slides, uh, it was not approved. There's the uh, immediate release, which you usually use up to 15 milligrams TID, the typical starting dose is 5 milligrams. The extended release and transdermal, the immediate release has the most side effects and the worst cognitive effects and the other forms have less side effect. Tilteridine and uh, fosteridine uh, are similar medications. Not a lot of evidence of those in neurogenic bladder. Solofenacin or Vesicare, we use a lot um, because that was the only extended release we could use in North Carolina with Medicaid. Um, it has seems to have the most constipation. I have not much data on this medication. And tropium, because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, I sometimes use in those with some mental issues. Uh, Mirabegron is a beta-3 agonist. There's limited data in neuropathic bladder, and it's not approved for use in children, though there are ongoing studies. Um, this study, it's an adult study using 50 milligrams from the Czech Republic, and it was blinded placebo in um, patients with uh, nerd neurogenic detrusor overactivity from spinal cord injury or MS, and there was a statistically significant difference in neurogenic detrusor overactivity and compliance. Change in bladder capacity was close, but not uh, statistically significant. There was a decrease in pad weights and quality of life surveys and symptom scores. Uh, the only drug-related side effects was in one patient, and that was not hypertension, which is the most common side effect. <clears throat> 
uh, adult study from Canada, same dose, uh, similar population, and they found no statistically significant, significant difference in any urodynamic parameter, had weights for avoiding diarrhea, quality of life surveys, and they only saw improvement in one and two symptom score assessments. So this wasn't as uh, promising. They saw no side effects. This study of children, also 50 milligrams. Uh, some patients were in combination therapy with anticholinergics, and others, the mere background was used to substitute for an anticholinergic. They saw improved capacity compliance, detrusion over activity, and reflux. Of the incontinent patients, 37% were completely dry, and the 18% had more than 90% reduction in incontinence, and 26%, 50 to 89% side effects in 9%, constipation, which is a little surprising, headaches, and one had hypertension. So it's a reasonable alternative, and combination therapy with anticholinergics may have a role. Uh, what about Botox? An adult study from 14 centers in Europe, 125 patients with spina bifida, it was retrospective, and they had one to 17 injections between every seven to 12 months. The global success of the first injection was 62%. All your dynamic parameters were improved by six to eight weeks. Poor success was seen in those with low compliance versus detrusor overactivity. A female gender and patient age were associated with success. There were 20 complications, weakness in three, hematuria and UTI. A pediatric study from six centers in Europe, 53 children, uh, all had spina bifida, one to eight injections. Global success was 30%. That's half of what that adult study showed. Meningomyelocele's had less success than those with closed form of spina bifida. Clinical success in 66%. Urodynamic success in only 34%. And there was more success for those with detrusor overactivity than poor compliance. Only 38% were still on therapy and 43% underwent surgery. What's that surgery? Well, it's bladder augmentation. And you can use ileum or colon, ureter if they have a non-functioning kidney and you can do a nephrectomy and use a dilated ureter. Tissue engineered autologous bladder uh, was very promising, but it's not really stood the test of time. Auto augmentation, where you strip off the detrusor from the dome of the bladder was popular when I was a resident in the early 90s. That doesn't work, and that's why you don't see it anymore. Uh, stomach uh, works well, but has more complications and isn't used much anymore. Um, there are significant complications, and the early ones are related to bowel surgery and BP shunt getting infected. Uh, metabolic acidosis occurs, and that can lead to osteoporosis because the leach buffers out of the, the bone. Um, if you use terminal ileum, you can have decreased vitamin B12 and bowel salt absorption. Um, bladder stones can occur in up to 50%. Bladder perforation is obviously very worrisome, particularly in somebody with a BP shunt if you're spilling colonized urine. Uh, what about malignancy? So these are the things we worry about the most, These because these are things that can be lethal. A little bit about content catheterizable channels, the metrophenol or appendicovesicostomy. Uh, if it, you can't use the appendix, you can take a piece of ileum and do a Monty procedure. Um, bladder outlet intervention for continents. Um, you can use alpha adrenergic receptor uh, agonists like Sudafed. Um, injection of bulking agents, a urethral sling, and that can be autologous from the patient or an off-the-shelf cadaveric human fasciolata, a xenograft like SIS, synthetics, which I wouldn't recommend in children, a bladder outlet procedure with or without a sling or suspension, or artificial urinary sphincter. Um, what's not listed here? Bladder outlet closure. We typically don't do this in children. They're going to be teenagers. What do teenagers do? They don't listen to adults. They often don't catheterize, and so we'd rather our patients leak uh, a little bit, then but risk rupture. Um, I really find this the white whale of pediatric urology. I think the outlet uh, is extremely humbling, um, and I was humbled at Spina Bifida Clinic uh, yesterday seeing some of my long-term patients.
Uh, anytime there are a lot of surgical solutions to a problem, there's not a single good solution to a problem. This study from 20 years ago is still pretty accurate. I'll go over it briefly, but you can see that the continents uh, of these different therapies, for the most part, it gets in the 80s. I don't believe this 100%, but you can see these continence rates aren't very good. Sphincter may be the best. Most of them are going to need to do CIC because they're not going to leak easily. The revision rates are significant, and need for augmentation uh, is significant. So do you need to augment the bladder? Because if you tighten the bladder neck, now the bladder's working against pressure it's never seen before. Well, there were two studies from Dallas um, by Dr. Snodgrass, and this one showed that there were outcomes were equivalent whether you did an enterocystoplasty or not after a sling. The augmented patients had decreased need for medication and had longer CIC intervals. Another paper the next year, um, only one of 35 patients was augmented, and another patient that same year, all were stable, and six of the 26 needed increased medications. So 10 years ago, people began to become more enthusiastic about not doing an augmentation and avoiding the complications, but there's no free lunch. Um, Dr. Snodgrass left uh, the Children's Hospital there and follow up of the same patients there in 2016, 109 patients with bladder neck surgery without augmentation. 54% had additional continent surgery. So that tells you that almost over half need a revision surgery. 18% needed an augmentation. 46% had new reflux and 21% had new or worsening renal scarring. The estimated 10 year cumulative incidence of augmentation cystoplasty was 30%. Another continence procedure, 70% upper tract changes 50% and CKD 20%. So they stated because of these risks, careful patient selection and close follow-up are essential if considering a bladder outlet procedure without augmentation cystoplasty. I would add to that patient, careful patient and parent selection. You've gotta be able to trust the parents to get the child to do what they need to do. And I would also say that careful surgical selection and technique are important. Uh, and that's with or without an augmentation cystoplasty. So I think uh, management of neurogenic bladder it is, has a high success rate in preventing renal failure. It's not perfect. Uh, we are improving the quality of life. Uh, CIC is performed by about two thirds of adolescents and adults in the National Spinal Patient Registry. The choice of medical therapy is complicated in some. Surgical therapy can be successful, but complications are common. Water outlet procedures can be challenging. And bowel management is critical as well. And don't forget about sexual function. There's not enough time in this hour to cover those topics. Dr. Kavari will cover them somewhat. What's the future? Well, is proactive management superior to reactive? If we are more aggressive up front, will we need to do fewer bladder augmentations? Well, a randomized control trial is just not feasible. You need too many patients, too much time, too much money. So a protocol that was developed at the CDC with pediatric urologists, and we are following newborns at nine sites with the same protocol. We refine the protocol as dictated by the results. And this is called the umpire protocol, which was initiated in 2014. The protocol here was published in the Journal of Urology in 2016, led by my partner, Jonathan Ruth. This is a protocol. I don't expect you to be able to read that, but you can see that it's outlined there. A lot of people think this is the new guideline. This is not a guideline. In fact, the new Campbell's, it came out in March, has a goes over this as this, we're saying these are guidelines, these are not guidelines, these are our protocol that we will be modifying. But it's done so that the umpire is trying to keep bladders and kidneys safe. So I'll stop there and I will unshare my screen. Um, please uh, let us know your thoughts of the survey today. And Dr. Gavari is my moderator and she will uh, Go over some questions.
Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Wiener. This was an excellent discussion. Uh, we have like four questions, and I'm going to maybe we have time to discuss two or three of them, and then the rest we will respond later and post it on the website. Um, one of the questions we didn't talk about tethered cord, it's, uh, it was in my talk and we removed it as well, but I think this is a question that comes up frequently, so maybe you can have your thoughts and I can share mine as well. And that is, we frequently see neurosurgeons ask for neurodynamics before they would do a tethered cord release as if that would dictate how they're gonna proceed, whether they're gonna do it or not. Um, so what are your thoughts about this pedicle release? Um, I guess it could be in the, in the picture of patients with the <coughs> that history of spine bifida or without the spine bifida, spine bifida, like a cold pedicle. If that would improve the GU outcomes clinically or your dynamics in the, in the, in, in your case, it would be more of the teenager children that you would see that would have this issue. Well, but we also see it in, in some infants that are noted yeah. to have a, a, a normal, uh, yeah. uh, lower, lower back and so I think any child with suspected uh, spinal cord pathology should have urodynamics. That's really the best test to look at function of the lower spinal cord. Uh, it's better than doing EMGs of the legs. So it's really our EMG. So, uh, so that's one indication and the neurosurgeons will ask us to do urodynamics. It's probably good for them to cover two so that they can prove whether a kid is starting out life with normal bladder function because if they don't toilet train and they're five and they did surgery at 12 months of age, did they cause damage to the bladder or was it already uh, neuropathic? Um, so uh, that's one indication for doing neurodynamics. The other thing is a patient that comes and their bladder's getting worse. Um, and say they're eight years old and they're getting worse and there are no other symptoms, there's no lower extremity symptoms, you definitely go to do your dynamics to see, you know, are there upper tract changes or worsening incontinence or recurrent UTIs. Um, so if you find a change in the urodynamics, is that because the bladder's changed or is that because the nerves have changed? We don't have a good answer to that. I used to send more patients to have detethering by the neurosurgeons, but I've seen those patients get worse and, and lose the ability to walk. They, they can walk with crutches or braces and it damages a little bit of their lower extremity function by detethering them. And um, uh, I'm glad I'm not a nurse surgeon looking, everything looks the same. All that stuff is white, nerves and scar. And so I think that untethering can sometimes cause more harm than good. So I'm not a huge fan of it unless they're having penile pain, lower extremity pain, or weakness or numbness, and then I think they need to have it if they're lower extremity symptoms. But if it's just bladder, I'm more gonna address the bladder. Not I, everybody's gonna agree with me on that. I actually completely agree. I would do a baseline video your dynamics to, to document where the bladder stands. However, I counsel the patient that that should not guide them whether to have a surgery or not. That decision is based on other symptoms they have with their neurosurgeon, but they should not have it to improve their urology or expect to have their urology symptoms or your dynamics be improved. There is actually, I coded, I put this in the chat, there is a good study in, from Canada in 2016, Journal of Urology, that they uh, did a randomized trial um, on like 20-something patients for surgical treatment versus medical treatment for uh, spina bifida, uh, for uh, tethered cord occulta, and um, they did not show any improvement and urological outcomes. So just something to keep in mind. Um, the other question is regarding reimbursement and coverage if we are going to adopt the proactive management as far as getting your dynamics. The, the question is about your dynamics specifically, but maybe as if, we, if the decision is to get ultrasounds yearly and your dynamics yearly, how, how, what do you think about the coverage and the reimbursement in the uh, proactive pathway? I've, I've practiced in North Carolina and Mississippi, um, have not really found it to be a problem. Uh, it, uh, majority of these patients are Medicaid and it's typically covered. Uh, and the surgeries have typically been covered in, in, as well as Botox. I mean, Botox is a little more difficult because it's not FDA approved for use in children, though uh, Allergan has done the study and is asking the FDA for approval. Um, sometimes a problem with some of these other medications that aren't oxybutynin. But in terms of 
doing tests, uh, it's been okay. Ultrasound used to be an issue because they wanted us to see the patients within three months because they're worried about medic uh, nursing home patients um, and wouldn't be sure they were still alive before the test was done. Uh, we argued with our state Medicaid and said, you're wasting everybody's time, including yours. Um, these patients need to have annual ultrasounds. They don't need approval. They don't need to be seen three months prior. And we got that changed. So if you're having trouble with coverage, often you can talk since the SBA guidelines and the ESBU guidelines are helpful. And again, those weren't there five years ago. So you've got uh, that to back you up. Um, from the adult standpoint, there are no issues with the imaging, like ultrasound, if you want to get it yearly or if even if you need to get it more frequently. Your dynamics, you can get it approved. Again, there's more hoops to go through, especially if you're in a private practice. Most and you practice in Texas, which has the highest uninsured rate of population in the country. Uh, most of these patients are on Medicaid um, and sort of HMOs that are not covered very well. So we do have to get a lot of prior authorization to get a lot of our urodynamics approved. However, it, it can be done. Like we did a study that hopefully we can uh, publish our results soon in adult to get urodynamics before and after Botox injection. So it can get approved um, and you can do it yearly. However, specifically in adults, there's another issue which I'll talk uh, in my part. Um, it's getting to the medical centers to have it done yearly if they don't truly need that urodynamic yearly. So that's a different issue to discuss besides the, the coverage, but it can it, 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 it can get covered. Um, so what is your favorite bladder neck reconstruction in children, Dr. Mina? Um, so I used to um, do just a sling and I found that didn't work very well. You'll find on a lot of patients when you look at their urodynamics, that the bladder neck is not innervated properly. So instead of the urethra looking like that on the urodynamic, uh, video urodynamics, it's funnel shaped okay. because the bladder neck isn't squeezing it down. And so you've got a wide bladder neck. And so just doing a sling around that doesn't work so well because you've got a wider thing that you're trying to do the sling around. And the sling can't just be a use uh, sling like uh, adult female incontinence. It really needs to wrap around and cinch. Some people even go around up 360. But it, so what I do is I taper the bladder neck, sort of described by Mike Mitchell for extrophy, where I, I narrow the the, uh, the urethra uh, in females and the proximal urethra in males uh, down to about eight French, and then do a sling around that. And I think that gives you a better ability to compress that. So combination bladder neck reconstruction. I'll uh, the Mitchell technique with a sling. So I used to do the same, um, a lot of autologous slings and I would just harvest the rectus sheet at the same time that I'm doing my augment. I rarely do a public procedure without an augment, but in adults it's much harder to get the whole fascia closed, especially after you harvest this strip of fascia. So I've started doing a lot more fascia lata that gives me, most of them are not ambulatory anyways, so I can get a long strip of fascia lata and I can do the spiral wrap. Uh, because I also learned that the closed U or the O shape, um, it, it's not as successful long term. Or we also started for selective patients, started doing uh, females, uh, artificial urinary sphincter. Actually, we were the first one to do the robotic one um, here in the States. But for selective patients, we would consider um, uh, sphincters as well. Um, and and uh, uh, I'll just add to that, first of all, it's reassuring that we, we've never, uh, Dr. Kavari and I know each other online, but we've never uh, been in the same room, but we still have the same preference. Uh, so that's reassuring. Um, I typically use the cadaveric fascia lata. It just saves time. These kids have, have had a lot of leg surgery. I uh, don't want to slow them down. Again, it's, some of them are, a lot of them are pretty chubby, so uh, you don't want to really compromise your abdominal closure. Um, sphincter is the only thing that they can possibly void. So if they do have some ability to void, and they just have a weak outlet, these are typically going to be sacral myelomeningoceles that are ambulatory and have normal legs, some of them play sports, um, then the sphincter may be the best for those patients. And how do you deal with the GI issues in your pediatric spina bifida patients, Dr. Weiner? Well, I'll tell you the, that um, <clears throat> study that uh, from the National Spina Bifida Registry where we found that really the most thing that correlated or was associated most with employment and college 
education was bowel continence. And that really made us think. And so we're really addressing constipation in infancy. And we have now gotten uh, pediatric surgery more involved, just their nurses, because we don't have the time to counsel about all of that. Um, at some centers, pediatric surgery does all the bowel management. Uh, we find it if we're in there, we've got the hood open and we're doing an augmentation and the trophin off, we might as well deal with the bowels. Uh, but we've become very aggressive and we, uh, we do, a lot of uh, do a lot of MACE procedures. Uh, it does no good to get somebody dry if they're still pooping on themselves. And from Szymanski's data, uh, you know, quality of life is really affected by, by fecal incontinence. Also the bowel's gonna, I mean the bladder functions better and you reduce the risk of UTIs by minimizing constipation. It's um, a little bit more challenging on the adult side because the adult GI physicians are not comfortable taking care of neurogenic bowels. And even when we do the maze, it just becomes this very unknown procedure for adult colorectal surgeons, general surgeons. And, um, and if the maze fails and we need to get a C-costomy tube, none of the IR guys do it, none of the colorectal do it. It's just a little bit more challenging to manage the GI side of things and the adult side. And unfortunately, um, we can't really count on our colleagues to, to give us a lot of input and help with that. Um, we've actually been uh, lucky to find um, med peds physicians who have partnered. Um, I'm sure some of the PMNRs could do the same, who have partnered with us and they manage the medical management of these uh, adult congenital patients who have uh, neurogenic bowel. And they've been very wonderful to help the maces. I basically had to reteach myself how to do mace procedures in adults, um, uh, either open or lab. Uh, but because every time I approach any of our colorectal surgeons to do it, and they, they said, no, we're not gonna, we've never done it. And I say, it's, it's very simple. You guys do more complex procedures. So. Um, I think that is one of the issues in the transition that needs to be clearly addressed with, uh, with, with the leadership to help with the GI and the neurogenic bowel. Yeah, gastroenterology training does not deal with neurogenic bowel at all. They, they know nothing and, and urologists know a lot more than, than they do. So one last question, um, and that is the McGuire <laughs> paper that you mentioned, which is a very important paper for everyone to read in detail. So the hydro that was discussed obviously was seen on the IVP. The question is, would you expect the same amount of hydro if uh, we do ultrasounds now, or would that be more sensitive, or would there be more, more hydro if we do the, repeat the study now using ultrasound? Uh, I think it would be pretty similar, uh, particularly uh, the ureteral dilation. Um, uh, you know, and I, <laughs> Most of the audience probably hasn't looked at IVPs or many IVPs, but ureteral dilation, um, you're gonna see the ureters on every IVP and you'll say, well, that one looks big. Um, on an ultrasound, you shouldn't see the ureters if they're normal caliber. So if you see them, that's abnormal. So I don't know that sensitivity for ureteral dilation changes much. Um, upper tracts, uh, again, you know, how much is, a little more than normal. So I think that's going to be pretty similar. Because we often call a little bit of hydronephrosis within the range of normal. You know, like SFU grade one is to me almost a variant of normal. You'd say the same about uh, a little bit of dilation on IVP. So I think you'd find the same thing. Thank you. I think we addressed all the questions. Um, if you guys have any more questions, uh, please email us or email Michelle and she'll forward it to us. Um, Dr. Wiener and I really uh, try to combine our sessions, uh, so he will be moderating my session, which is coming up in the next few minutes, and it will be the adult spinal bifida uh, urological care. Um, I think we can conclude this session now, um, unless you have something to add, Dr. Wiener, and then close this session, and then we have to open another Zoom with its own ID. Um, Michelle, Christy, you guys have anything to add? or? Um, no, um, so we can just move on to the next room, and we'll see you all um, in the next room. In How about if we, um, if we go ahead and start the poll while people are logging in? I know that you give like five minutes for people to come in, but we can start the poll questions. There's only a few of them.
at the beginning of my talk. So while people are logging in, they can maybe whoever it's available, they can go ahead and start, and then we'll start at 10:10 that you had originally planned for me. Yes, we can do that. Perfect. Thank you. See you guys in a little bit.